So <clears throat> we can start. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to my talk about building a full site in Drupal 8 Alpha, or how we used to say now um, at some AC Labs, uh, Grützial, um, easy way that we are um, a Zurich and Austin based company. So um, Grützi as hello of the Swiss German word and the Yal of the US. Um, my name is Michael or Schnitzel um, on d.org or also um, on Twitter and wherever you find me. I'm head technology at Amazi Labs and um, when I'm not um, upside down taking a picture, I actually usually take a picture of all of you. So I, I took the picture of the group photo, um, which is on Flickr if you want to search yourself. And actually there's a video as well and um, it's not released yet, uh, but will be short to be there too. So. Why building a site in Drupal 8 Alpha already um, before it's even beta, before there's even an upgrade path? Well, we decided as a company to um, we do it as a learning experience. Everybody of us at one point we need to do Drupal 8 sites, so why not start as early as possible and doing it? So it wasn't a decision that we said, okay, we want to do it and um, to learn a lot of stuff about it. The other side, of course, it's also about research. So we wanted to know what is the status. All our customers, they ask us constantly, what is the status, when it will be ready, can we start already? So we said, okay, we're building our own site, which we have the most control about it. Nobody actually expects us to deliver something. We do it with the aid to figure out what it's, if it's possible or not. And at the end, it also was some insanity. We really, we don't like sleep. And we like to we like to stay in the in, over the weekend in the office, and we like to support our local pizza deliveries. So, <laughs> yes, it was also some intent. Okay, what I will talk about is first about the process. How did we even start doing that? First thing, and you see there, it's February two thousand thirteen. So more than a year ago, we decided we want to rebuild our own website. And the first thing is building your own site. The hardest part is the design. Because you do every day, you do designs for your customers, but when you do it to have it for your own, that's the craziest. Because everybody has ideas, everybody wants to do something, and so. So we started in February 2013, and it was more than a year of process to actually figure out the design. When I say figure out the design, there is a lot of progress in there. So what you see here actually was the first idea we had. And nobody really liked that, so we had another idea. And we maybe liked that, but we changed it a bit, so we had another idea. So you can see like the designer's long shade suddenly popping up. So at the process of like a whole year, at the same time, all the design changes. So we suddenly we have iOS 7 with flat design, so we get influenced, or like our designers get influenced every day. So we had another idea as well. Um, and you actually see slowly how it's building together when you look at it as it is today. So it's a bit too big, fortunately, but um, if you go to mazelabs.com, that's how it is. So the first thing we actually did was we designed the whole thing, and we designed it in Photoshop. It's not done in any browser because we said we want to do whatever is technically possible. When you do something in, 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 in a browser, you do a lot of things. Um, you design a lot of stuff that you th that you only do because it's possible. And we had a lot of stuff there. When I looked at it, I was sitting together with my themers. We didn't even have a clue how we built that. But we said, we try it, and we go through it. So I told my designers, or the designer, which is actually sitting here, um, do whatever you want. I constantly was checking with him to figure out if it's too insane, is that even possible. But we gave him a lot of freedom to do whatever he comes up. So after we had the design, we built our war room um, in our office. We, we printed all the designs, we put them on a wall, and together with site building people, with themers, so you see me, Catherine, which is also here, and Bo Catherine is the themer, Boris was site building. We're sitting together and discussing how we do that. Usually we don't never do that, because we know how to build stuff. So a lot of people, can everybody which has a... Pl as um, a seat, uh, raise your hand. A seat on left and right side, raise your hand. So you can walk in and sit down where people were handing hands, sit down there so everybody gets a seat. Perfect, thank you. Okay, because usually we can, we look at things and we know already how stuff is built. 
we have a lot of country modules, we know how stuff is done, but with D8, we knew we have core. There is no country module yet, or when, when there is a country module, we don't know how good it is. So it was a lot of iterative process. We thought about, okay, can we maybe build it like that? Can we, can we not? Um, we were like trying stuff out. So it was a long process to really figure out, okay, how do we build stuff? That took around um, a month, mid-March to mid-April. And then actually in April, we started theming and backend development. So we actually, um, after we site built it, we went into theming, we fixed some backend stuff, we had migrations to do and stuff. And then end of April, we did the testing and the bug fixing. And um, yeah, that's how our issue queue looks like. So the arrow is actually the launch date. So we started to test like three days before we went live. And that was like one of the weekends I mentioned. So uh, yeah, it was crazy. So the red line is the amount of open tickets and the green one is the closed at the same time. So you see there's still a lot of stuff open. Um, so it was a crazy time at the end. But we've done it. And on the date that we wanted to launch on time, on the minute, on the 29th of April, our DevOps hit the button and we had our site launched and everybody was happy. Okay, so how have we done? What were the issues? First, site building. At Amazing Labs, we almost build every site with panels. The problem is, it's completely missing in D8. <laughs> so that was the well, that, well, there was not even there was not even a start to do something. Um, so what we've come up is, as views is now fully ent is is an entity itself, and in views headers and footers, you can include other entities, and as views is an entity itself. So we basically created a lot of in inception of views in views. Of course, we could do it in custom code. That would have been a possibility. But we decided on first thing we want to know what is possible without custom code at these days. Because it's easy when you have something that is not yet done um, to just write custom code. And then we definitely would have the people for it. But we want to see if it works. And if, if it, because we find actually a lot of issues in there with some, some, some views bugs and so on. So when we look at the site like that, that's our services page, you see on top there are three services we show. Then there is some very, very XL with a picture, and at the bottom you already have, you have again services. So there are different view modes. And that's the view how it looks like, so that's the page for it. So that's the service page, and you see inside of the header we have another view which shows the three on top, and that's how our page is built. Not really the best way, but it works. It's a bit inception, and we try to not include a view in a view. So it's like maximum one page. And in there, there are um, details. Another big topic is um, everything is done with view modes. So when you know in, 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 in views, you can either show a view mode, a rendered entity in some type of view mode, or you can do fields. At the Maze Labs, we only do view modes. Um, multiple reasons for that. In D8, a special one is caching. Because now Drupal, had, Drupal 8 core has um, caching based on view mode level. So whenever you show a view mode, it's the same everywhere. So the stuff is really fast. And also we try to do, um, we do that with every site to only have um, view modes and not any um, lists of, uh, of fields inside of views. The problem is we use Panelizer and Panelizer is obviously also missing. And there is Display Suite um, already ported to Drupal 8, but the problem is it's not, it does not have enough flexibility that we actually need. We wanted to have full control over it. So we ended up in feeling like going back to the roots. If you do every day with Panelizer, we went back to Twig template files. So we just took our Twig template files and we changed them. One of the problem is that a lot of theme suggestions are missing. There are no theme suggestions for uh, view modes per entities, no view modes for fields. There is no um, theme suggestion for page, so you can say like, I would like to show this page whatever time you show a user or a node, I want to have it different. There are also no theme suggestions for forms with the form ID if you need to do something special, or even a custom block. There is one template file for all your custom blocks you will ever create. So it's a lot of stuff missing, and um, we're currently checking with like um, theming people in D8 how, if we really want to add them to core. We believe yes, they should be in, 
um, but we're still figuring out if that works. If not, we most probably um, just check that it's going to go into a base theme. Um, yes. So how does that work? The process is that, that the site builder that actually created the content type, he is the person that really knows about the single fields, like where is the information actually stored. And what he does, he creates a Twig file with all the variables just in there. So we don't use just content. We really went in there and said, okay, we want to position the stuff ourselves. So he just puts it in, in one row, and he doesn't really care about the HTML because the HTML is the themer thing. So after he done that, the themer goes in, and the themer changes it to whatever he would like to have. So yeah, it's wrappers, two, two different things. He uses HTML5, whatever you need. Even there is like an if. So sometimes we have screenshots, which was not yet sure at the beginning if we will have screenshots, so you add some whiffs. So it's a process of the site builder preparing and the themer taking over and doing that stuff. And that actually works with Twig template files really, really nice. It's something that doesn't really work with Panelizer. If you want to have your own HTML, it's a lot of work to do that. The problem is if you want to do something special or like load additional information, like the birth date of the author or so, you just need to do pre-process already, and that's just coding and not site building. So, so that was actually the whole um, site building part. Um, we did everything with view modes. We had a lot of views in views and everything was done with Twig template files. After that, we usually do, we build the whole site just in basically black and white or like wireframe style without even touching the theming. So we first do the architecture of the, of the data, of the nodes, of the content types. And then we go into theming. Again here, there is no base theme. We build usually with Drupal 7, we use Omega for all our base theming needs. But when we look in core, it's actually not necessary. You don't need a base theme anymore. Base themes, how we use them in Drupal 7, do a lot of resetting for us. They make them HTML5 aware. They give us some frameworks around um, to use better um, JavaScript stuff. And so, but from the actual HTML code, core is pretty nice what it outputs. So, um, how we've done it is we built CSS and our grids fully custom. We used, the first time we used 2C2, um, and as HTML5 and core, we didn't really need that. Um, so when I say CSS and grids are fully custom, we usually never use predefined grid systems, because as I said, I allow my, th my designer to go whatever he wants to do. So we have like a grid system for every page, which is different. But with SUSE 2, that works really well and allows you to have a system that um, is reusable in different sites and you just change your grid systems and so on. But of course, the biggest issue was the missing theme suggestion. So we, that took us a really long time to figure in them out, to build them in, to do them, to learn how they work, because usually they are there already in 7. So Twig. I put it a less than three in there, so it was definitely really nice to work with Twig. It's 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 at the beginning. It's hard to learn because it's like your your brain knows how you would do it in PHP, and then you you search for okay how I do it now in Twig. But after a couple of times working on it, you learn how it works, and it makes it so much better. Your code looks so much nicer. It's easier to write. It's hard to debug though, but we never really had to do that. One of the hidden superpowers, though, of Twig are extends and blocks. I won't mention them. If you're interested in them, go and check them out. But they're not really used in, in, in core itself because they're hard to understand. But when we figured out how they actually work, it was really nice to use them and make easier page and change stuff re um, easier, so if you're interested in that. One hard problem, though, was accessing only a value of from a field. So when you look at the example with the content field title, this shows you the wrapper of that field immediately. But if you want to change it, like to have an H2, and you only want to have a value of the field, there is no documentation how that works. It's actually used at one single place in core, like in the message template. So it works with that dot zero. That means you get the, uh, the value of the first element inside the field title because it basically could be a multiple field 
Um, and with that, you not get any wrappers with the field title. You only get really what the user entered in field title. We use that a lot. Maybe we use it too much, but um, it was just like one way that was really hard to, f to figure out first. And then also, if you need additional stuff, it was a bit, um, was, was a bit tricky there. Another problem that we had, which is what we tell our themers is that whenever they want to change something, like in a theme function, you go into core, you search for the function that already does that. It's called theme underline username. And what you do then, you copy it over into your used to be template file. Now it's the dot theme file. You copy it over to your um, theme. You change whatever you want to change. You save it, you clear caches or you rebuild caches in Drupal 8 and you go to the site. The problem, it will fail. And it will fail with a PHP error that the themer has no clue about it. The problem is new attribute. The namespace for attribute is not copied. So I'm not sure. So what you actually have to do, you either define the namespace on top or you call it directly from the Drupal object. But I'm not sure if this is something that we can tell our themers to like learn about namespacing and stuff. So that was a lot of issues that when, they, when the themers tried to do that, they came to me and said, ah, I broke the site. It's like a PHP error and uh, class not found. And they no, have no clue about classes and objects. So um, that was really hard in the beginning to figure that out and to explain them how it works and to use that. So that's maybe something that we have to do there as well um, for just the experience of the themers to make it easier for them, either explaining them how um, how namespacing works indirectly, where, the, where we explain them how to copy paste theme um, functions or somehow. Next topic, configuration management. Um, definitely the new kid in the block, never really, nobody really used it before. Um, how we usually build sites is that sites are site builded. So while we do site building, it already happens on the dev server. So it doesn't really happen locally on a, on a on a developer's um, computer. It directly happens on a dev server because all they need is core and can configure it. If they need, need a new uh, contrib module, in case there are some, um, you can download that with Trush, etc. So from the beginning, we didn't really use configuration management at all. But at one point, you have a lot of different people working on it and they change a view locally and then they usually they will create a feature or maybe do the whole step again, but we really wanted to use configuration management. One issue there, there is no Git integration out of the box. So there is no explanation or there's no standard yet how to do um, Git with configuration management. The current process that we used was we created a new config directory inside default config. So core itself comes with an active and a staging directory, but you can create your own, your additional one. And usually the active and the staging um, directories are inside default files, which is excluded from Git ignore. But um, we added one into sites default config, which is then picked up by Git. So whenever um, a developer on his local site that changed something, and that's pretty much al almost everything. So if he changes a field, if he changes a view, if he changes whatever, something by the UI, he has to export that configuration. And Drush already has uh, configuration management um, integration. So you do Drush config export config dash dash add dash why? What that is, um, he basically exports the config into the config directory that is defined in settings PHP. With the dash dash add, it automatically calls Git to add these changes to the Git, so he does not forget that. And the dash Y just accepts all the changes. Um, then he commits them and he pushes them. And then he goes to the dev site, either you have an automated system or not. And then you make a Git pull, which will change the YAML files, so the configuration is saved in YAML files in the config directory. And you can just uh, drush config import um, them and it will integrate them. Really important though is that every change needs to be exported immediately. What happened for us is that somebody was working on the dev side. He was playing around with a view and he was happy with it and he was like looking at it, whatever, working with it. At the same time, a local dev changed a completely other view. It doesn't have to be the same. It can also be a completely different change. He exports, goes to the dev site, makes a git pull and says drush config import, drush config import config. And now the configuration management thinks, 
the view is not in your import. So he really imports whatever is in there. He imports in there. So he basically deleted the view because the config management thinks that it's maybe deleted. And that's something different from features. In features, you just say what things you would like to add, but not what to remove. And configuration management does that. So it's, um, I try to figure out if there is a possibility to prevent that, to like say what is really good is that during a Drush config import, Drush shows you what will be done. So it shows you stuff will be added, what will be deleted, and what will be changed. The problem is then when you are at a point there that, um, that you realize there's something wrong, you need a lot of Git knowledge to, okay, now how do I export now the current configuration and merge that into my changes? So it's a lot of hand writing. So what I told my devs is whenever you make a config change, directly export it and you will be safe for the future. So that was configuration management and it actually helped us really well. So whenever you do a change on your local, you do whatever you want. You go into fields, you change them, you create views. You don't even have to create a feature. So there is no such a thing of bundles like how we know them from features. You just export the whole config, you go to your dev site, you import the config and everything is there, which is really nice. The process is really fast. And, um, and a lot of times when I actually um, export the config, and I look at the changes and I realize, oh yes, right, I changed that field as well, which I definitely would have forgotten while creating a feature or so, where you need to know what you just changed. Next topic, updates. As I said, it's Drupal 8 Alpha. There is no upgrade path at all. So whenever you change something, um, or whenever there is a head update and you, you wanna do that, you have to do a lot of work. And that's the process. So first you make a backup. You make a backup of your site. Then you make a git pull and a git merge. So basically what we do, we merge the newest changes from 8.x branch, we merge that into us. The next thing you do, you just visit the page. <laughs> maybe you clear caches, maybe that doesn't even work because that already fails. Um, <laughs> so you maybe go into the database and clear all the config files and then you delete the PHP directory which is in there and then you visit the page and you definitely have a wide screen of dev. So you enable all the errors, which is usually done, and then you s look at it and you see an error. And then you start your step debugger and you go through, and then, okay, you, you see like an error in maybe menu, and then you go into the recent change notices, and you go in there and you don't, okay, good, and then you, the only thing that you can actually do is go to the database, in, uh, you, you go to the heart and change something that you believe that maybe it is, and maybe it works, and maybe not, then you step debug again, you rechange notices again, you do it, so there is no process, honestly. There is no way how to do it. If you ever have to do that, these are the four, four, the four things that work the best for me. First, read the change notice. They tell you a lot what has changed in your site, like, there is maybe a new configuration part, or there's a new menu, or there's something. So you at least get, okay, these are maybe the things I will find. Step debugging helps you a lot, like realizing what works. But sometimes you don't even know how it should be. So what I did a lot of times is I create, I install a fully new Drupal 8 site on another, on another dev instance, and I look and I compare databases. So I went into and I realized, okay, good. So that array changed now. It has an additional array. And then you edit serialized arrays in the database. And so, so that was a lot of things. And also compare stack traces with new installed sites or step debug at the same time with new installed sites so that you know, okay, on a fresh Drupal 8 installed, this hook has to be called and then that, and this class should be there. And then you look at your site and you realize it's not there. So you learn a lot of stuff how Drupal 8 works. Um, you, I step debug probably like three, four times through a whole Drupal 8 um, stack trace call of everything. One really fun one was that one. That took me like six hours. <laughs> it's called consolidate system module and system theme and system theme disabled into core extension config. It's an issue. So I, I didn't mention like if you want to go to read the issues, that will be a lot of time. The error I had was that, call to undefined function system region list. If you read that error, where would you go? Where would you go? 
Any ideas? I went into the theme. System region, theme layer, very defined. So I maybe thought, okay, there had to be something changed in the regions. Well, it wasn't the case. So the problem was actually the issue on top that they changed the config. It used to be system.module, system.theme, and system.theme that disabled it. It was its own keys inside of my um, of the config and now it's core.extension and the problem was that my Drupal site was loaded without any module because there was no module to load and no theme to load and the first thing that called was that system underline region underline list was somehow not included from theme.inc but basically it call it started a Drupal site without any modules the best is and unfortunately is not here there is in the issue of that is a comment of Alex Pot saying, do we really need a change notice for that? No, we don't need it. Because I think better, as he writes, I've debated whether or not a change notice is necessary. I think better than change notice will be a set of documentation on how the A2X extension system works. I mean, I totally agree with him. It's not that like I think the change notice so should handle my case. But after, after like six hours during the night working with that and like scrolling through the issue to learn and you read that and say like, ah, oh. <laughs> whatever. I learned a lot of stuff. I can tell you now how the, how the core extension looks like out of my head. I can fix sites which have like module, uh, modules installed. I don't even need Rush to install modules now. It's, I can do it in the database, so that's, that's fine too. Um, yeah, so it's just a lot of fun learning how things work. Okay, next topic, multilingual. Actually, my own thing, as I'm part of the D8 um, MI team, so we did a lot of stuff there. We had some issues, though. Um, first, there is an old thing that's like ARC, which usually tells you um, like in which path you are, which is used a lot in different modules. It's deprecated. And interestingly, it also contains the language path prefix, which is not the case in 7. So rather to wait to actually find, um, to have the issue fixed that, is, that contains that I had to hack ARC, that he excludes the language prefix to actually work. Then interestingly, and if you go to our site, that's still the case, um, field label translations are cached too hard. So if you visit the German site and afterwards the English site, some stuff is not translated. That's the reason for it. Then we have some issues with entity reference load, loose language info. So we have a lot of issues. They're all created on Drupal.org and people are working on it or we already have fixes for them. One really interesting thing is the menu link translation. So there is currently no way in DA to translate menu links. Um, people are working on it, it's really hard um, because of different reasons, but I want to show you our code. We basically just put the T function around every title of every menu. It works. Um, the, the problem is just when, when somebody changes the title, you have to translate it again. But I mean, we all know it's not used by any customer, so and sometimes it creates like strange stuff. But it works. That was like, a, what's that? seven lines of code fix um, for, for doing something. So yes, we hacked core as well. We had to, it wasn't like even possible. Next topic, we have an already existing site in Drupal 7 um, and we had some blog posts. The other problem is that the migrate module is not yet ready at all. There is some migration path from D6 to D8, but there is no from D7 to D8 and we hoped that it's at a point, but we couldn't do anything. So basically, we had to build our custom migration from scratch. How we done that? Um, we have, a, on the D7 side, we installed the service module and made an endpoint to connect, uh, to load all blog posts via JSON. On the Drupal 8 side, we built a custom migration module, which is inspired by Migrate. So it uses a bit the same structure, the same um, idea, which basically loads the JSON files on the D7 side fills them, it has a mapping, fills them into D8 objects. Really nice working with the entity API. It's much easier to create any entity from code. Fill that and save it. Basically, that's it. It's pretty easy. If anybody's interested in the code, you can see it. Um, it's just straightforward. Um, but the good stuff is we only had to migrate blog posts and the blog post authors. So we really stripped down because every other stuff we changed anyway. And we didn't migrate any comments. 
because we said, well, it's a bit sad, but we have to strip out stuff. So that's what I mentioned at the beginning. Because it's our own site, we can do such stuff. Like a customer would never allow us to remove comments when you upgrade from one site to another. So that was migration. The next topic, um, backend development. Um, so we had to do some things, some small adaptions, like we have, um, w what we wanted is like when you comment, so we have again comments on the site that you um, immediately assign um, or sign you up to our newsletter. That was idea and um, some other stuff. So um, we, what you do is you go out there and you search for examples. You search for examples out in the world, um, how it works. The problem is a lot of the examples that you find on a, di a lot of different sites, they don't work anymore because core already changed. So that was really hard that, because usually you go out there and you search for examples and they work, but then they change like really nitty gritty small things in the YAML that you don't realize at the beginning. So that was a lot process to find good examples of things. The example module was also really hard. Um, because it's, it lags behind as well. And if you're like up to date with head to head, the example modules obviously takes time. So we also most of the time scratch that. Um, so what we did is we basically took easy modules or modules that we thought are don't take views or whatever. So to take like an easy module that doesn't do a lot of stuff and look at it and learn how, um, how you create your own pages, how you define routes, how you define things. Another part is uh, look at tests. So a lot of time tests actually give you a lot of help how things are supposed to work, how you call stuff. Like if you're interested in how do I create an, um, a node from code, um, completely from code, most probably there will be a test which tests exactly that if that works. So you go into the tests and you look at their, how do things work and how they, how they are done. One really hard part was the theme render cache. So as I said before, there is a lot of new caching in, in Drupal 8 that's really cool. The problem is that your code is not called anymore because it's cached. And if you just disable caches, um, that's not going to help you because it's still in. Luckily, that's now fixed, so there's a setting to disable that. But during our time, uh, we had like every desktop or like every local environment had like a small terminal on the right side and you saw like Drosh CRs, like endless amount. And it took a long time because, um, yeah, well, every time you do make a Drosh CR, it just takes a long time to load and to do stuff. But at the end, um, it, we were able to do our things that we really wanted. There is a lot of stuff open that we really want to do. At the beginning, we saw there are a lot of still open tickets, so there is improvement to do. But um, also that, it was really nice. So coming to a resume, um, it works. I mean, you can go there. We did it in time, um, which honestly is a bit um, surprising, but we have a really great team that, as I said, don't like sleep at all. So that's, that's, that's a really good thing. Uh, we created a lot of DRDO issues, uh, or a lot, a lot of issues on DRDO where we, had, where we found stuff that we never even thought about. And actually, the developers and the themers, they don't want to go back to D7 now. So, <laughs> which is, I think we are on the really right path. So, I mean, from, from a developer's point of view, um, and being myself a developer, it's, such, it's so easier to learn how things work with like classes and interfaces, and especially the interfaces which tell you like how stuff works. Um, and for theming, I definitely see that like all the things that you need a base theme for in D7 is now all in core. Um, Twig makes your life a lot easier. You don't need to learn a lot of PHP. Um, so the problem is we still probably will build the Drupal 7 sites for the next two years, or maybe for the next one and a half years. So I'm really sorry, we can't go yet. Uh, we can't migrate everything yet to D8. But um, it was nice. And if you ask me if you should do the same, As I said, it depends how, how good your pizza delivery service is. It's like, um, so, no, it's like what I would do, I would wait for beta. Because for me, the hardest part was really the head-to-head -head updates. Because it's, 
yeah, you're basically thrown in some code and you have to dig. If you want to learn a lot of stuff about D8, that's one way to do it. There may be better ways, but it's one way. Um, but um, I would wait for beta because when we have upgrade paths, that issue will fix a lot. But then I really encourage all of you to try it out, to play around, to find issues, to come up with things that nobody ever else thought of. Create the issues on Drupal.org, write them in, there are people there which will find um, if it's a duplicate or not. But it's really important for all of you that, that we all together make Drupal 8 what we want it to have. And that's only when you go in and try your stuff and play around and so. So that's it. I hope you learned something and you're not scared of Drupal 8 because it's not. It's actually pretty awesome. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer them. You have to come stand up, walk here, and talk to the scary microphone. Hi. I was, hi. I was just wondering, uh, how often did you chase head when you were working on this? Four times or so. Okay. So, so it and wasn't like a weekly thing or anything. Well, we built the whole site in four weeks, but oh, <laughs> well, then it was a weekly. Thing. <laughs> it was made pretty much a weekly thing, like my weekends. So, like we worked over. So, what I did, I mean, I being active in core myself, you know, like with I which issues are are coming in. So, like I waited a long time for the issue that changed. Um, that the active config is not saved in files, it's saved in the database. So that was one I was waiting for. That, so like, that I know like the, the more a bit milestones, I waited for them. So I did it like in total like three or four times. Currently, we're completely waiting on beta because okay. we are happy with the site how it is right now. So depending on when we have beta, I hope I will probably need to do one or two additional ones. But then we hopefully have an upgrade path. Cool, thanks. <laughs> Hi. Hi. So um, you mentioned that you built your own little migrate code to yes. to import in your um, your blog posts and stuff. I'm curious, um, you know, if you have a certain number, you know, just copy pasting, you know, having someone manually do that is sometimes the the best way, just because it's fast. But did you get a sense um, until migrate's ready and people are using that, if people did want to start using beta, you know? Like, what do you think in terms of the amount of code, like, amount of, you know, nodes or whatever that need to go over? Is there some sort of threshold yes. you think, well, if they've got, you know, tens, yeah. they're yeah. fine, but not hundreds? So we had 300 blog posts. Yeah. And we already had a squad team of people waiting for me telling me we can't do the migration, and they basically will come over the weekend and do it. By hand. By, by hand, manually. By okay. manually copy-pasting. Okay. Um, at the end... Writing the migrate code took my backend developer one day. And that's definitely less than anybody could have done that faster. And it's actually more bulletproof as well. Um, we, like, while we migrated, we realized that we made um, a site building change. So we introduced a lead, which didn't exist before. So we actually had to compute a lead now. A lead, like a lead field. So we used to show the full blog post on our blog overview, but now it shows you only a teaser with a lead. And um, and that was a decision in design and what we never thought that we don't have such field. <laughs> so like while the migration, we run the migration, then like the teasers are all empty and saying, oh wait, there is a lead now. So we re-rolled back so that we also, we also implemented the rollback system in, in the migrate. And um, so, and then we just did it again and I guess if we would have done it by hand, it would probably be like end up in saying, okay, now you people, you have to do it, again. not again, but like to do things. And mm -hmm. so it was easier, but I, I think like 300 was a point where I, I, I had no clue how long it will take. I estimated between one to four days implementing the migration. What was really good um, because I have, a, I have two developers which do a lot of migrate itself. So they do a lot of migrate code. Um, yeah, we just gave you a shot. I told him, look, if you start doing it, spend half a day. If you can give me an estimation, then we decide. And um, so your question coming back, I would say if you have like 100, 150 nodes, that's probably the, the time. Okay. And, and I'm happy to share my code Yeah, I was well. going to say, where you, can you share it? Yes, we okay. can. it's not yet anywhere, but um, yeah, it's we can definitely do it. Okay. Yes. Thanks. Hi. 
Hi. Thank you for this. <coughs> um, so I was taking notes yes. as uh, you were talking. And of things that are issues with Cora that are not related to, oh, by the way, it's alpha. Yeah. I counted only two things that were issues that are addressable. Yes. And I was wondering if, like, I, the ones I found were we need more theme suggestions out of the box, mm -hmm. which sounds pretty easy to do, and some way to, to streamline the um, dumping uh, config file to staging process. Yes. Which yes. also, to me, at least sounds fairly easy to do. Yes. Is there anything else that's related to Drupal, not it, the fact that it's alpha, but just the Drupal itself you'd recommend that are things we can do that just are going to make that process easier for people along those lines? Any other things we can do now that we just go ahead and do to improve that developer experience? I think the biggest one was the theme suggestion. That's definitely the one. The okay. other one was the one with the, with the theme copy-pasting. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you wanna, how we want to fix that. So how many theme functions do we have left? I thought almost all of those are now templates. I would need to check. That's like actually a good question. Yeah, it's like, definitely way less than we used yeah. to have in seven. My, my understanding was the goal was to push everything to templates except for like two or three that okay. are called super often. Okay, so then, then, then I would then definitely yeah. So I, the one that I've we used was that was myself. theme username. <coughs> that's probably one of the two or three that's still yeah. left. And then maybe I mean my suggestion would be that we then just don't use the namespacing mm -hmm. in in core itself, so directly load it from from the Drupal object mm -hmm. and do a not standard way, but make it easier for themers, or right. maybe make a comment somewhere, because it ended up in themers oh. sitting there and having no clue at all. <laughs> right. But yeah, beside of that, the, these are probably the two things that, that I see the most. And those all sound really like simple, easy things to do. Yes. I, I'm going to take that as a compliment that like, we've done a good job with it. Yes, so that's you, really we, good to hear. we definitely did a really <laughs> great the job. <laughs> that's the biggest problem you can find with D8. <laughs> then, uh, Yes, and Go it's a multilingual you. site too. So we, mm -hmm. um, if like the org stuff, but that's already addressed. So that's then then we'll see. And the other stuff is like, so if you're wondering about um, layouts and things, so panels, um, so there is initiative or there are people currently working on that because that was like for us the biggest point of like, oh, that is missing. So people are actually working on, there is already a module which is called Page Manager, which allows you now to do some stuff. So that's awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, Hi. I thought that method you showed where the backend developers outputted all the variables to the Twig file and then the themers came in and wrapped it with the H HTML. Yes. I thought that was really cool. I hadn't seen that done exactly like that. I'm curious though, did your themers uh, develop the theme in static HTML and CSS and no. then move that over or they just no. went directly into the yes. Twig? Yes. Okay. So our normal process with Seven is that um, the site is first site build it in a wireframe type. So we look. We have most of the time we have a finished design or a finished wireframe. Um, That's in Photoshop. A, a finished design in Photoshop okay. or a wireframe in yeah. some kind of wireframing tool. Then the site build builder goes in and builds that, but more like in a layouting. Um, so he maybe uses um, an already existing two column template or so in panelizer and panels. Okay. And then the themer goes in and changes what he needs. But the themer basically gets the HTML already pretty much defined. Um, so with that, um, we never really build like prototypes or like we first define the HTML. We used to try that actually like three years ago, we started with that process because that's what everybody else is using. The problem is it's like with seven, it's so hard to get your HTML in there. So what we saw us is actually like creating the CSS again. Um, so we read to go the process there that, that we first do the site building and then the themer comes in, looks what HTML is there, changes it to according its needs, like going from that stage to that stage, but pretty much work with the HTML um, that is there and not come up with a whole site theme. So in your situation, the themers, are, they're just very comfortable with writing directly into Drupal and, and flushing cache and that kind of thing. That's yes. just part of their process. Yes, they're okay. Drupal themers. They're not like Got it. Okay. themers that can just do HTML and CSS. Okay. Got it. Thanks. So when you were explaining the four ways that you tried to debug things, or, mm -hmm. or not the way that you tried to debug things, I guess the way you tried to find out what had changed 
Well, the fourth one was that you looked at tests. So these are the test one is I. Or no, 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 I, no I, I never looked at tests. To no, when you were trying it. to figure out what. There was when I'm trying to figure out how stuff works, like yes. how to build my own custom modules, yes, yes. I look at tests. Okay. So <clears throat> how did you know, like which, like it, for example, you looked at a module like... How do you know which tests to look like? Yes. How do you know which tests to I don't know. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> like I, let's imagine if like, I search... No, like, like let's say yes. you have a module, you're looking at an example in core, and you see it has a method or something, right? And then you're like... Um, you know, I wonder which tests... Did you run coverage reports to try and identify which tests? What I did once is, like, I looked at all the tests that I could select, just to look at them, to look at their names. The simple tests. The simple tests, yeah. And at one point there was, like, one... Was it node clone or something? And I said, hmm, that sounds interesting. So I went to the code, and then I saw some code that actually copy-pastes um, or that, that creates a clone of a node, of an already existing one, and saves it, and it's a new one. So it's a lot of like looking at test um, names, but also knowing like like okay, stuff for nodes is most probably not in the user module. Right. So like more like looking into the user module, and but it's a lot of discovery and. So you read tests. You treated it like a book, like a table of contents, and you're like, I think I will read that chapter. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay. uh, because there are no example modules. So. <laughs> but the cool stuff is now with, with Drupal 8 being all in classes, you can actually guess class names. Yeah. So, uh, like, if you like, type, I mean, if you use an IDE that, like, knows all the classes and gives you suggestions, like, type in clone, and maybe there is something. So it's a lot of, <laughs> a lot of finding stuff. Hi. Quick question: How many custom modules did you end up writing, more or less? Um, did you end up one. writing any? Oh, one. One. So the mo the site currently has installed three modules, three content modules. Our own. Then we have global redirect in because the SEO is pretty bad, and um, the last one is Honeypot. That well, I fixed it. <laughs> 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 Wait, well, well. Let's say, let's say if you, I figured out in which orders you have to change the configuration that it works. So I didn't actually write code. It's like you, like one, one of the select boxes that breaks everything. So I just tried and say, try it over and then it works. But yeah, so like the problem was the first spam we launched at nine o'clock and the first spam we had at nine, nine, nine hour, one minute. <laughs> so actually like after we were happy, we were like, fuck, we have to fix now the spamming. <laughs> <laughs> Which nobody, like, I thought, like, well, can we get at least two hours? Because, <laughs> because, like, you know, it's like there is no HTML. Like, the, 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 the HTML of a Drupal 8 is not really common to spammers, <laughs> but it looks like that we use, we use so many machine-readable code now that the spammers <laughs> are super happy, which are super good probably for accessibility and so, which is great, but it's also good for spammers to find our code, yeah. Global redirect, Honeypot, and a custom module that does stuff. And another question. Uh, you mentioned you use view modes in yes. views. Yes. Um, I don't know if in Drupal 8 you have more than two view modes. You can create them you via... Create there is now a UI to create view modes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Finally. So it's like so one of the things in... in yeah, it, there, there's, so you can create your own. You can define them. You can attach them to entities, so yeah, they are there and it, you should really use them. Okay. Oh. <laughs> okay, good, then if you have more questions, if you want to see code, um, come and hit me.